Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. This is uh, the Dialogue of Con Continents Conference. And uh, this is last, but certainly not least, uh, the final panel. And the topic is the three R's. So we are going to talk about resilience, reshoring, uh, and repurposing. So this is going, going to be a fascinating panel. So we put that at the very end of this conference. So this could be kind of concluding panel, uh, summing up all the topics we have discussed so far and uh, probably leading the way to the future. So we have talked about new paradigms of policy making, the new geopolitical order and sustainability, of course, greening the economy. So all these are very important topics and we are happy to conclude with this panel. And uh, well, just to have mentioned that I'm, I'm uh, fascinated by the concept of anti-fragility. I, I, I'm, I, I'm sure you all have heard of that, Taleb's concept. So we put ourselves into a crisis to get stronger. So this is what we feel right now that we need to, to, to get stronger. So, so far from, from my side, and I would like to introduce Marie-Christine von Hahn. I'm very grateful that you accepted to, to be chairing this panel. So that was at very short notice. So I'm very happy that you agreed on sharing this panel. So I give the floor to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Henning. So we will see whether that was a good choice or not. That will for us to be decided at the end. <laughs> Yeah, I'm as sure. Henning just said, um, my name is Marie-Christine von Hahn. I'm Vice President for External Affairs at a company called Arubis. Maybe the, the one or the other one knows us. Uh, we are a producer of copper, originally based in Hamburg. This picture comes from there. Um, and yeah, so why we have um, obviously from an industry perspective, our own views and ideas about how, uh, how to make ourselves resilient. Uh, in times of crisis. But this is not uh, my call to make today, um, maybe later, but not now, because I'm, I'm here with, um, with three very honorable and very knowledgeable um, experts uh, who I'm very happy to introduce in the first place. And we proceed in alphabetical order. And uh, there we starting with Enrico Giovannini. Very welcome, Enrico. Uh, very happy to have you here too. Um, Enrico um, Giovannini is a professor at Tor Vergata University of Rome. He's an Italian economist and statistician. I practiced the term beforehand, but it results difficult for a German tongue. Um, he has been with Tor Vergata ever since uh, 2002 as a full professor. And uh, in the meantime, he was also minister of labor and social, politics, uh, po social policies in the latter government. Um, he's also president of the Italian Statistical Institute, director of statistics, and sh chief statistician uh, of the OECD. So yes. good afternoon. We are very, very excited to hear from you what you think about the three R's. And then with us is Petra Roman. And I must say, Petra, after having read your, your, your CV, it seems a little weird to announce you as a professor of the uh, University Polytechnica Bucharest, which you are, but your CV is quite impressive. Um, you started out already with a, uh, with a quite um, impressive technical um, career before the breakdown of the wall in an engineering uh, segment, which is very tricky as well, hydroelectric engineering. But then uh, with the breakdown of the wall, you really uh, served your country in a very enormous way. Um, you, um, you, you were involved in tearing down uh, the Ceausescu dictatorship and you became the first prime minister um, of the first post-communist uh, government. This is very, very impressive, as I said. Um, and for us all who, who um, also coming from a company, a uh, company, country myself, uh, which was so heavily um, suffering under the division with families being torn apart. Uh, this really gives me goosebumps. Thank you for being here. You have uh, afterwards, after being first prime minister of the first post-communist government, you had several other uh, offices such as um, senator, speaker of parliament, minister of foreign affairs, just to, and chairman of the Democratic Party of Romania, just to name a few of them. 
Thank you for being here. And then going over to Spain, with us is Federico Steinberg. Um, uh, Federico is senior analyst at the uh, Spanish think tank Elcano Royal Institute in Madrid. Um, he's the senior analyst for economy and international trade. And he is a professor of economic analysis at Madrid's Universidad Autónoma. He has also an enormous variety of, of expertise, an enormous variety of career steps. Um, he has a PhD in economics, economics, also from the Universidad Autónoma, Master of Science and Politics of the World Economy, and a Master in International Affairs from Columbia University. So as you can see, um, everybody who's on the screen now, uh, we, don't, we have several European countries. We have an enormous range of expertise here. Uh, and uh, we are very, very excited to see what this is leading to. Before coming to, to your impulse statements, let me give you a brief introduction to the topic. The Dialogue of Continents, Henning uh, just said so, uh, today has been dealing with the era of massive change we are currently in. We have a pandemic, which certainly nobody of us has experienced before. Um, we have recurring gruesome terrorist attacks. We have unsolved migration causes and movements. And we have obviously elections, not only in the US, but these days apparently very much so, but all over the world showing heavily divide, divided societies. All this certainly creates great uncertainties among the people, among policy leaders, and also um, obviously in business and industry. Now, this is the thing about change. It is heavily disturbing, but it might also give us the opportunity to reimagine our future. And here come the three R's, resilience, reshoring, and repurposing. Those three R's can provide maybe, or maybe not, um, a framework for decision makers to deal with this change. And this is enough for me to say, because I'm not the expert, you are. Uh, and I would like really much to hand over to Enrico now to give us his first impulse statement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for organizing uh, this event uh, and this great panel. Um, let me start from uh, uh, a personal experience. Uh, when I stepped down as a, a Minister of Labour, I got two calls. One from the office of the Secretary General of UN to contribute to the preparation of the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development, as far as statistics were concerned. And the other from uh, the office of the uh, President Juncker, uh, President of the Commission, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker to become a consultant to the uh, European Political Strategy Center. I accepted both. I helped uh, to, um, to shape up the 2030 agenda. And this, by the way, was completely for free, but I was so happy to do that. And the second uh, was uh, uh, a different type of engagement uh, where I tried to push the 2030 agenda for sustainable development as well as uh, ideas for a new policy framework based on the concept of uh, vulnerability and resilience that we had developed uh, at the UNDP, in the UNDP Human Report uh, in 2014. I tried to push these two different concepts for 18 months. And finally, the head of the cabinet uh, uh, asked the uh, person to tell me that I had to stop pushing these things because there was no way for the European Commission to embrace the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development and a policy framework based on vulnerability and resilience. I would say four years later, 2-0 if we were in a soccer game, but unfortunately um, we are not, we are in trouble. Uh, after uh, leaving uh, the EPSC, I started a consultancy with the Joint Research Center of the European Commission to try to build a, a new policy framework based on the concepts of vulnerability and resilience. And uh, at this point, uh, a few months ago, after a few years of research, the cabinet of uh, President von der Leyen had decided to embrace this approach 
And in fact, as you know, the facility through which the Commission is, the European Union is providing a lot of funds to European countries is the facility for recovery and resilience. So let me explain a little bit what is behind this concept. In poly policy terms, this is a chart coming from uh, the uh, system theory and the fact that uh, uh, we can end uh, with a system that is uh, highly vulnerable and uh, um, low resilience, or we could end uh, with uh, a system with high resilience and low vulnerability. The point is that there isn't any single decision making process that makes the system working like that. There is a sequence of decisions and each uh, uh, crossroad, if you wish, is an opportunity to build resilience, to make our societies, economies, environment less vulnerable or to make them more vulnerable and less resilient. The point I would like to make is that it depends on how you perceive your future. The reason why the head of the cabinet was so um, against these ideas is because he said there is no way to go before people and saying the future would be full of shocks. But now, even President von der Leyen tweet uh, saying uh, one day we will uh, uh, find uh, the uh, vaccine against coronavirus, but there is no vaccine against climate change. Against the climate change. So the idea of uh, having a 21st century, unfortunately, with a series of shocks, this is a, was a tough idea for and it's still a tough idea for those economists, politicians who didn't embrace the preamble of the 23rd agenda, which says we are in trouble. Look guys, we are in trouble. And the economic, social, environmental and institutional weaknesses and vulnerabilities uh, risk to link each other and make our systems unstable. This is why we try to work developing uh, a new scientific narrative towards uh, more resilient uh, societies, but especially to build uh, policies built on these kind of concepts. And uh, the report issued by the European Commission just a few weeks ago, strategic uh, uh, foresight and resilience, is the result at political level of this work. Resilience has now been announced in this report as a new compass of European policies. And this is simply great, but which kind of resilience? Resilience is normally considered the capacity of a material, of a person, or a society, an economy, or a company to bounce back if uh, uh, they are shocked by something. Here, we try to say we want to go back only if we were in a sustainable path. But if we weren't, why should we go back? Therefore, we need a transformative resilience, which is much more than just bouncing back. Let's take uh, this example. We have uh, uh, this chart where you have the disturbance intensity of a shock and the time of exposure. If both are small, you hope to absorb them. But if they are mid-size or stay longer, you need to adapt your system. But if they are very large or very long, you need to transform. Well, Europe in 2008, 2009, hoped to be in the absorptive, in the stability area. And after some adoption, some changes, in uh, fiscal rules and others, 20, 2011 and 2012, a lot of people were thinking that we were back uh, to the stability phase while we find ourselves in the transformative area. What we have developed is a system approach to resilience, 
where the resilience of outcomes depends on the resilience of assets, but also the resilience of the engine, the machine that we have built, our socio-economic paradigm. And therefore, I don't have time to go through this. This is based on uh, um, what the uh, ecological economists had developed uh, uh, in 1997. And that here I added uh, one small box, which is the social system services, that similarly to ecosystem services make uh, uh, possible our life. Uh, social system services, uh, trust, peace, common vision of future. And this is where we are now in trouble, like we are in trouble with the ecosystem services. Instead of bouncing back, we need to bounce forward. And I'm close to the end. Let's take two countries, A and B. At time zero, they were enjoying the same level of well-being. A crisis hit both. Country A goes back to the previous level of well-being at time T1, while country B doesn't. Everybody would, uh, would say, Great, A is much better than B. Therefore, B, please follow policies that A follow. But this is true only if A was on a sustainable development path. If it was not, and the second shock hits, it's possible that B reacts much better than A. In this case, it's clear that we have to deal with the short-term policies, but aimed not only at boosting recoveries, but transforming our systems in order to make them more sustainable in the long term. And if we apply this approach, we can rethink about the classical classification of policies. Instead of having um, economic, social, environmental policies, we can rethink about policies that prevent shocks, that prepare for shocks, that protect from shocks, that promote the transformation, and then transport transformative policies. And depending on where you are, you have to rebalance differently this type of policies. Why is this so important? Because we are exactly in this position. And this is exactly why the Commission has uh, now taken up uh, this approach, talking about transformative resilience and also indicators for measuring vulnerability and resilience. So let me just conclude uh, with one chart where we at the Italian Alliance for Sustainable Development try to apply this framework uh, to the more than 1,000 articles of the budget, no, sorry, of the uh, new regulations, laws adopted by the government in response to the COVID crisis. And what can we see? This is the example of the first three decrees. Most of the actions were to protect and very little to transform, prepare the transformation and so on and so forth, which means that Italy uh, used more than 100 billion euros, not to prepare itself to the jump, but mainly to protect, to reduce the impact. And of course, this is not really transformational as we would need to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Enrico. It was very interesting. Um, and I must say, what a good luck for us all that you got those two phone calls after you stepped down, because otherwise you wouldn't have developed the concepts. Thank you very much. What relieved me very much to see was on your first slide that um, even though you might take at one point a wrong decision, which you find out later on, it doesn't uh, do so much harm because you still can correct them and, and end up in a green line still. It's, it's a good sign. Okay, thank you very much. Going over and handing over to Petrin. You are on mute, Petrin. 
one of the most frequent, frequently used sentences these days. There's a button on the left downside. Yeah, now, do, do you hear me? No. Okay, fine. Wonderful. <laughs> well, uh, in your uh, very kind words of presentation, you mentioned the uh, various uh, political uh, missions I've had. Uh, but in fact, before I became absolutely by total surprise the prime minister, I was um, a professor and, and, and a passionate scientist in, in the field of the physics of fluids and the environmental sciences, and namely <clears throat> about turbulence, which is the main, the main reason of many, many changes, of the most uh, drastic changes uh, in, in nature. Uh, instead of uh, presenting uh, some concepts, I, I, uh, I would start by telling you one of my own stories as a scientist. During uh, 10 years between uh, 1975 and 1985, I, um, I was um, um, uh, performing with a group of scientists uh, research on the uh, quality of the water of the Danube water all along the uh, 1000 kilometers of the uh, Romanian reach. And um, then in 1975, uh, all our samples, I mean all, uh, a large uh, majority of those samples uh, all along, I, I'm, I'm repeating uh, more than 1000 kilometers from uh, the uh, border with the with former Yugoslavia to the discharge in the in the Black Sea. Uh, Seventy eight percent of the samples show uh, has shown that the quality of the water was not only good; it was uh, drinkable water. We saw people uh, on the shore taking uh, water from the Danube and uh, drinking. I was amazed, but they knew better. <laughs> but Ten years later, in 1985, we, 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 when uh, unfortunately the authorities decided to stop this research, which was uh, all, all, um, all the um, <clears throat> characteristic, I mean, hydrodynamical, chemical, biological, the whole complex. Well, 10 years later, uh, the um, quality of the, Dan of the water in the Danube was uh, de dramatically decreased. The samples show that uh, drinkable water was less than 33%. What happened in between? Well, in between, it was <clears throat> a threshold. And this is the, uh, one of the key issues, including in, 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 in our uh, subject, uh, the resilience. I mean, the body, uh, which is nature, or our body, or uh, uh, even the society, has a natural resilience. Uh, until and they are able to maintain uh, more or less a good shape because they and you don't feel the transformation is slow and uh, is uh, almost uh, unnoticed until the critical threshold the tipping point is reached and beyond that critical, uh, critical point beyond the threshold there is a radical change and uh, a very uh, a very strong loss of resilience and this is uh, something which uh, right now is uh, uh, probably occurring in uh, in uh, in the our great great subject of the climate change uh, we are obviously increasingly increasingly under the pressure of uh, of the complexity and, and uncertainty uh, and the, the, pan the pandemic is uh, the perfect example, example of our strained uh, world. Uh, the characteristics of the second large wave of infections uh, globally right now is pointing to an unpredictable year ahead. Uh, unpredictability, unpredict unpredictability appears to be pervasive and is there, as I said, in the intimacy of nature, weather, biology, chemistry, and of course, even the quantic uh, physics. But more and more, the cultural propensity of individuals, uh, 
individual individuals of large communities, nations, are also generating non-linear, as I as we say it in in physics, non-linear uncertainty. In in this case, in, in this situation, resilience is crucial. As I said, nature itself uh, has a remarkable amount of resilience, but it's not unlimited. Our societies have a, an, a, an amount of important amount of resilience. It's not unlimited. Uh, as uh, Professor Rico Giovannini uh, very, very interestingly uh, uh, pointed to, transformations occur. They are, uh, they are there and we have to cope with, uh, with these uh, transformations. And I, I, he, he, he also, this nuance, he, uh, I think he touched very, very nicely. Resilience is not about, by definition, to oppose change. It's, uh, it's about to bounce back. It is about being able to, to, uh, be shocked by an unpredictable uh, event, an unpredictable uh, event with the very strong grave consequences and to be able to bounce back, to come back uh, and to reach a level of, um, let's say similar to the previous one or even better than, uh, than than before. Uh, resilience helps, I would say, fundamentally to contain unresolvable tensions. Because as we all know and see, there are some unresolvable tensions and the pandemic has shown it uh, plainly. Social change is uh, also inevitable but should not be unchecked when the outcome is obviously uh, damaging, negative for the people and the environment. The question is how to tell the difference between unnecessary change and the unavoidable set. Well, the way out is to think about how we should and can protect our society and the, what must change. And the Professor Giovannini obviously uh, indicated some needed change in, uh, in tackling the problem of the uh, climate change. Uh, The concept, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's very much at the order of the day, is global resilience. Because global resilience is about global cooperation. Cooperation is the solution, yes, but more than that. Cooperation is the only solution, the only solution. Because, because, uh, global co cooperation is underpinned by the more and more obvious, real fact, our common destiny. And uh, the new era, because uh, the subject of our conference was the new era. Well, to finish, I would say the new era is the spirit of cooperation intertwined with the spirit of uh, innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Petra. That were very inspiring words, I must say. And I was, uh, I'm relieved that you mentioned the, glo the, 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 the perspective of global resilience to being the, and cooperation being the only solution, because at times you have with all those reshoring measures at times, you had a little um, the, the fear to, could, could, could feel a little fear that in some in some eras uh, or areas countries um, yeah they really go back step up and take a step back and 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 
tend to nationalize much more again. Okay, one impulse to go. Federico, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And I'm going to try to give a political economy perspective because I think uh, I would uh, certainly agree in particular with uh, the, the environmental aspects that uh, Enrico and Peter have, have touched on. And I'm less uh, of an expert on those, uh, but I would like to introduce some of the constraints that we are going to have in terms of uh, political economy uh, moving forward in, in the three issues that, that are on the table, re resilience, reshoring, and, and repurposing, with uh, three ideas. Uh, first, which has already been explained, uh, the, the need for preparing for risk and, and building more resilient societies. I would say in all aspects, uh, health, of course, sustainability, but I would touch and connect with the idea of uh, reducing inequality and rebuilding uh, social contracts, which I guess are, are important for them being able to cooperate internationally. Uh, but this has a lot to do with the idea of uh, repurposing as well. On, on reshoring, I would like to, to speak briefly about what uh, Marie-Christine just mentioned, this tension between uh, autonomy on the one hand and interdependence on the other and everybody being on the same boat, but at the same time, everybody perceiving that we have a very tense uh, geopolitical situation with a rivalry between great powers, the decline of rules, and this is particularly uh, dangerous for the European Union, uh, but on the other hand that we are all in the same boat and particularly uh, to fight uh, uh, pandemics or to fight uh, climate change or to fight uh, tax evasion, for example, or digital taxation, which is another issue on the table, we certainly need more cooperation. And on, on repurposing, very briefly, I would like to touch on, on some of the ideas of uh, rethinking capitalism that were with us before the pandemic, I would say, the critique to hyper-globalization, the idea that the, the gains from uh, capitalism and globalization in the last three decades uh, have been very unequally distributed. And this has created uh, uh, some structures in the social contracts, particularly in, in Western societies, but elsewhere as well. And uh, now it's going to be primordial to rebuild the social contract domestically if we want to be able to cooperate more internationally, as, as Petr mentioned, right? So, so some, uh, some ideas on these three topics. Um, on, on resilience, uh, I, I would certainly agree uh, that uncertainty is with us. We economists have discovered this concept of radical uncertainty that Frank Knight and Keynes talked about. Now we understand that we are basically in the middle of the fog and we don't know if the fog is going to be with us for you know 20 meters, imagine you're driving, or for 10 miles. Or 20. And as long as the fog is with us, uh, the danger of more things going wrong, both uh, expected problems like Brexit, which is happening right in, in, in a month, uh, or uh, well, actually the end of the transition period, Brexit already happened, uh, or un unforeseen events, as Peter was mentioning, and also Enrico, things that can go wrong that we cannot even anticipate at this point, but are more likely to occur because of the accumulation of of, of problems, right? Uh, so I think that uh, it's clear that uh, there's going to be a purpose in most countries. Uh, and in the case of Europe, I would think about the European Union. I think next generation EU, uh, it's mainly about this, uh, of uh, building a more resilient society, first on health capabilities, second on some sort of uh, uh, economic and social resilience which has a lot to do with inequalities because we have just uh, realized that particularly in some countries of the European Union, inequalities are, are, are being larger than we thought and there are more people left behind. Uh, but also uh, it's very important how uh, you know, we equip our, our states to deal with this. And I think here there's a critical question which is to what extent are societies willing to pay more taxes after this shock, right? We can be optimistic or we can be pessimistic. I'm assuming we are going to need more fiscal resources. Of course, some people might disagree with that, but I'm assuming we will get out of this with huge levels of debt, uh, very high ratios of debt to GDP. Uh, I'm not particularly concerned about that right now. I think that we need to stabilize those levels to debt to GDP. 
uh, maybe we're going to need uh, some years of a little bit higher inflation. That's a very uh, hot topic now in the macroeconomics discussion, mm -hmm. like we had in, after the Second World War. But again, are we going to be able to, so to speak, uh, rebalance uh, winners and losers from globalization and revert a little bit uh, the less progressivity of taxing systems that we had? Uh, I think this is going to be uh, one of the key elements of, of resilience and of this rebuilding of the domestic social contract, right? Uh, on, on the issue of uh, uh, reshoring, uh, I think that here we've heard a lot about uh, this idea that this is going to be the end of globalization. Uh, actually, I don't think this is the case. My, my impression is that uh, we're going to see areas of uh, globalization where resorting is going to happen. This idea of we're going to move from just in time to just in case. So there are going to be new sectors we're going to consider strategic and we are going to be realizing, particularly, for example, in the European Union, that we were too dependent on, on external providers and even uh, areas like uh, technological sovereignty, uh, you know, the need for a European cloud. Uh, so it's not just masks and ventilators and, and medicines, it goes beyond that. Uh, and I am actually working particularly on this topic, uh, advising uh, High Representative uh, Josep Borrell on, on the concept of strategic autonomy in economic and technological elements, not in security. Uh, and this, I think, is something that that yes, to a certain extent is going to proceed. But at the same time, we have to be, as Mary Christine was, was mentioning, uh, you know, realizing that all the digital aspects of international trade are going to be accelerated by this. And probably this is going to be for good, even though it can expose some of, uh, of uh, new, new challenges to, to job markets. Uh, whereas other aspects of globalization might slow down. We can see probably uh, new protectionism, probably less likely with Biden in the White House, but uh, we're going to see precautionary protectionism. We're going to see less movement of people uh, probably during the pandemic for sure, but even for longer. Um, we are going to see probably less foreign investment flows, more concerns about strategic industries not being overtaken by particular foreigners. We have some, some of this in Europe concerning Chinese investments recently. Uh, so this is something in which we're going to see a mix of, of, uh, of more globalization in some areas and less globalization in, in others. Uh, but it's probably true that uh, we're going to keep sufficient amounts of interdependence and that the issues of uh, production costs are going to continue being uh, relevant as so not to, you know, undo a lot of the international uh, trade and interdependence. My expectation is that we can use this opportunity maybe to create a better globalization, right? Uh, Danny Roderick has been talking about this, Pascal Lamy as well. I think, you know, there's, there's an opportunity that, uh, for, for, that, for that. But that allows me to, to link this to the, the last point, which is really repurposing of capitalism, if you want. Uh, Branko Milanovic has explained to us that capitalism is the only game in town. Uh, either if you are in China or in uh, Washington, um, of course, uh, in our version in the European Union. Uh, but basically, uh, we, we, we need to actually recognize that the biggest risks, probably, if we are not able to have a, a repurposing of capitalism, and here I'm thinking about uh, the ideas mainly put forward by Paul Collier in his book on the future of uh, capitalism, or the economics of belonging by Martin Sandbu, or uh, Angrinomics by Mark Blythe. So there's been a discussion in this last year about how we, we, are, we, we have not been able to avoid that capitalism derails. We have created a, a system that is very effective in creating wealth, but very ineffective in distributing wealth enough, and therefore has a problem of legitimacy. And this problem of legitimacy actually can translate into uh, anti-parties, anti-system parties that actually uh, will have the risk of, uh, of a breakdown, right? Um, and this is something that requires probably building uh, a new social contract. And as I said, there's this possibility of being able to, to, to do it uh, after the shock, even though it's complicated. And only if we are able to do it uh, domestically in the US, in the European Union, in China, in other places, is uh, this issue that Peter, Peter mentioned of uh, international cooperation going to be realizable. Uh, and we are sure that we need, as I said, uh, to continue cooperating as long as we accept that uh, this level of interdependence is not going to go away because the alternative is really uh, much worse. So 
finally, just to conclude, I think that the, 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 the key idea has to do with a change in, in mentalities. I, I am very impressed recently to see a change in mentalities by central banks regarding uh, monetary policy and inflation as a, as a friend and not as a foe, let me put it this way, uh, which I think we're going to need some moderate inflation uh, in the future. Uh, and at the same time, uh, a comment on the European discussion on this, uh, this new approach by Germany in general, both in terms of uh, the internal uh, recovery fund, but also uh, the need for a European foreign policy that is more assertive in this in this world we are we are going to be living in. And I'm going to leave it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Federico. Um, again, what a striking presentation! And um, congratulations, Henning for and, and Mark for you, for for choosing you three because the scope is so broad. Um, I must say that I'm um, I'm used to. Uh, to, to lobby for our Rubis's interests. And um, we are, I'm in regular contact with very much exclusive politicians uh, in, in industry policies. And the discussions are, are a little different. Plus, those panels tend to be very extensive. And you manage to really make your points in a very abbreviated time and, and, and make people who don't have such insights like me <laughs> understand what you are saying. Thank you very much. Um, from what you said, uh, Federico, I really, I really appreciate so much this this whole approach of we should take this as a chance and rethink capitalism. The only thing that frightens me, if I look around my my own scope, is it will also, and if we now look at the U.S. Uh, U.S. elections too, it will also and again very much depend on the people. And I mean, we are probably all of us are in positions where we don't have any fears of existence um, uh, in, 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 our, in our lives right now, but there are so many. And then if I notice also this extreme aggression among people when once the, the government announces new measures to keep those infection rates low, like here in, in Germany, it's a complete mess. You, you think like the government has to talk to spoiled kids because, <laughs> because it is so little to be asked. And obviously you have people who, who have really to suffer, but the, those protesters are mainly people who don't have existence problems. And then, and this is what I want to say, I think um, the concepts are fantastic, but how can we make them real? How can we make them uh, become reality? Because uh, if it's not supported by the people and if you have those so uh, societal splits, I really have fears that it won't happen. I mean. Germany is, is, is having federal elections in, in, in September and the, uh, the populists, the, 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 the very right wing, not, not good people, <laughs> they have very good results in the, in the polls so far. So, well, but I'm talking too much. That's, that's one of my weaknesses. I like to talk myself, but I was hired as a moderator, so I'm, I'm going to shut down here. <laughs> uh, Henning, how is this working? Are people, can people... Uh, pose questions. Um, do we want to discuss among ourselves what is happening now? Yeah, they can, of course. So I, I will have a look whether there are questions or not. But meanwhile, you can, of course, uh, well, uh, give some questions to the to the panel. And uh, I think your question was was perfect to to ask what what is needed to create real change. How can we? What are the persons? What are the measures? Uh, how can we? concretely specifically create a change and uh, so not 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 just for those who are in in a in a comfortable position but especially for those giving up uh some privileges and that is quite interesting question i i think so that is what i'm also interested in okay so the question to you three how do we make this how we how do we make some, something good out of COVID and the current times, and how do we make rethinking capitalism become truth? Mm. Petra. Thank you. Um, this um, debate about uh, what uh, capitalism uh, is uh, or capitalism is, is capable to offer, or uh, capitalism is, uh, is uh, the um, root cause of the inequalities and, and so on. It's a very old debate. Um, 
I think that uh, so long as uh, capitalism is about the possibility of choice, um, as a, a great historian, French historian Brodel said, uh, as long, so long as capitalism is uh, capable to um, to uh, to have inside its mechanism, its uh, um, its um, uh, let's say uh, its nature, to revolutionize technologies, even Karl Marx said that. Uh, well, capitalism is indeed uh, there to stay, because it's exactly what we what we need. In the meantime, in the meantime, there is a there, it was. Uh, I, I mentioned the one aspect uh, about the pollution of, of my of our dear Danube. In those times, this is much less about that, but the climate change is certainly a very, uh, um, a very um, uh, specific and very strong example. Uh, there is sometime a conflict between the workings of capitalism, meaning uh, investments and uh, making uh, industries to be, for instance, today to be decarbonized, and the theoretical theoretical background. Uh, coming from uh, from science, um, we see that there is there is I, I see with the, with the, with some kind of optimism that, that for instance renewables uh, just twenty years ago were of no interest for the investors. Today, uh, a lot of investors are uh, thinking, okay, let's uh, let's take this train. Let's uh, let's be in in this train uh, about the the decarbonization, which is uh, so uh, clearly important in order to to push back as much as it is it possible uh, to push back the uh, the trend of uh, of uh, the uh, planetary warming. One very uh, obvious aspect right now is the. Um, <clears throat> What happens with the uh, ice on uh, on the uh, in the Arctic uh, seas? The ice which is melting, and you, you have a double, a double uh, negative consequence. Double because you have the change of albedo. In, instead of reflecting the sun, you are absorbing the sun, and then you just uh, they at the shore, they just eat the ice. You have more water, more humidity. In the atmosphere, and that changes, according to my dear subject, turbulence. That changes the whole the whole set of um, of the atmosphere, and it's not as some might think. You have more water, then you have uh, a better situation. No, it's not like that. It's very skewed. I mean, you have a lot of water suddenly. That water is provoke is is provoking floods and and a lot of damages, and is lost, mm -hmm. and then follows uh, periods of very heavy droughts. You have uh, a very, I mean, you are an increased unpredictability. The natural one, which is in our in, in the intimacy of nature, is increased by our, as I said, by our uh, uh, our uh, human. It's anthropogenic by our human. Uh, activity. Now, coming back to to politics, because you, you have mentioned, it's true that uh, what we can hope uh, a revolution in in the way the politics are 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 done are um, made all over the world. It's um, we have seen. I've seen uh, both uh, what happened. First, it was a communist revolution. Then came my revolution for the democracy and freedom, but there are a lot, a lot of things which, which uh, take uh, a lot of time. People have their own mentalities. Uh, many things are resilient in the bad sense. I mean, structures we, which are very resilient but are negative structures. So as always, uh, I, I think the the big. Um, uh, the big word is compromising. Compromising in order to achieve something. 
compromising in that sense that you do not lose the essence of what, what you think is needed to be changed, but to accommodate in order to, to put there the resources. Because politics is, is about mob mobilizing resources, offering and uh, in, uh, introducing those resources where they are needed and make, in, make the things happen. Uh, with those uh, resources. So right now, right now, with this surge of now some kind of nationalistic views, I, and, and we should see why, why that is happening. I mean, this is an issue which is unaddressed. Uh, maybe maybe um, a shrewd, uh, an intelligent uh, um, a wisdom uh, compromising, especially in those very important uh, issues, is uh, very much needed in order to get what? Cooperation. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. We have one question, but I would like the other two, the, the others two, to, uh, to, to give us your ideas. And Nico, go first. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what uh, can we do? First of all, uh, uh, learning uh, from uh, good stories, successful political stories. For example, New Zealand, where a young woman was able to take uh, a very troubled uh, progressive uh, party, win the elections in two months with new words, new faces, and then uh, take uh, very courageous, I would say, actions, but also changing the structure of the uh, public budget, for example, according to the principles of well-being. And then uh, she was uh, voted, she was confirmed with more than 50% of votes just a few weeks ago. So it's feasible, but new words, new ideas, new faces. Young faces, let me say so. Uh, Petra was uh, called to do what uh, he did. I went very closely last year uh, to be called uh, as a prime minister. Uh, and uh, uh, now I think uh, uh, what uh, we have in front of us is the great opportunity of Europe, mm. which means using uh, European funds mm -hmm. to transform. Right. Is, they are not enough, but indeed the, the keywords are indeed the right ones not only sustainability, environmental transition, the ecological transition, but also digital and fight against inequalities, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which are exactly the three pillars of what we should be doing. Then what can we do more? Uh, write books. <laughs> <laughs> you do that. Book, this book it's that your, we just published. Book? It's uh, your yes, book? Just, just published, uh, it talks about uh, a different world uh, that we can imagine uh, for which we can fight uh, and uh, which is possible to, um, to make. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a dialogue uh, between myself, another former minister, Fabrizio Barca, uh, who uh, has been working also with the OECD for many years. And uh, we try to answer exactly why not capitalism, but the capitalism of the last 40 years, which is the turbo capitalism, the neoliberal capitalism, even mm. before this crisis, was considered unable of addressing uh, the 21st century uh, big challenges, which mm. means uh, uh, planetary boundaries, uh, environmental degradation, and uh, inequalities, growing inequalities. But here, I would like to stress one of the points that we stress a lot of Italian alliances for sustain, Italian Alliance for Sustainable Development, where we have more than 270 organizations from business associations to trade unions, to volunteering environmental organizations and so on. And every year we publish a report, this was published just, just uh, one month ago about recommendations for policies. <clears throat> including, and then I stop here, the change of the constitution. To include in our constitution the principle of intergenerational equity. 
as it has been done already in France, Belgium, Norway, Switzerland. Because unsustainability of our development path is mainly about intergenerational inequity. inequity. Mm -hmm. And this principle was followed by the fact that they are, this principle is absent from the constitutions written in the second, after the Second World War. Why? Because uh, the dream of unlimited growth was making people convinced that new generation, by definition, would have been better off uh, than the older generation. And therefore, a lot of money went to the older generation. But now we know that this is not going to be the future. Mm -hmm. Therefore, changing the constitution, introducing this principle would be really transformative like in France and Belgium, which changed even the article of a civil code, which, say, which said that the aim of uh, companies was to make profits. So you see what I mean? That if you change the principles, you change also actions. I stop here. Thank you very I much. Connect with what Enrico was saying, but also with the question that we have that also Enrico referred to about, you know, how repurposing can, can, can uh, be about changing the, uh, the behavior of the firm and the behavior of consumers. And here I would point to uh, one element. I completely agree with the issue of leadership. I think uh, uh, good leadership is able to uh, change the ideas of citizens, but also being an economist, I think that incentives, economic and material incentives matter a lot. And we have the opportunity because at least in Europe or in the United States, that's not so easy in developing countries, we are very wealthy societies. And therefore it is possible to modify incentives and incentives when they change are going to generate winners and losers. And we have to be very, very, you know, cautious about not forgetting about the losers. This is the yellow vest movement, for example, in France, when you increase taxation on, on, on gasoline, which is something that we all understand is necessary. But we have to, you know, have what the European Commission is talking about, a fair transition, right? And I would also incorporate a fair digital transition as well here. Uh, so basically, uh, we have to use these public re resources in a way uh, to make sure no one is left behind and to at the same time, try to compensate those uh, you know, specific groups that are very clearly going to lose from the transformation. Because you know, uh, we saw in the American election, for example, that even if Biden wins, you know, the idea of a strong man, protective father, even if he's authoritarian, is much more appealing for many Americans than going back to the Paris, Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which may resonate very well with us, but on uh, the everyday uh, life of people without a job or, or you know, on sectors that are in decline or that will be in accelerated decline because of the pandemic, uh, this is something essential. And if we forget about this, which I think is what we did during the years of turbo capitalism, then we are not going to have any possibility down the road to actually uh, be doing international cooperation, uh, reshoring, repurposing, uh, Etc. Right. So I think we have to take the opportunity. I think the European Union has been up to the job. I was very concerned in March. I think Europe was part of the problem in March and April. Now is clearly part of the solution. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's try to use these funds well and also compensate the losers for doing this 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 uh, transformation. Very well said, Mr. Snow. Bernard Snoy is waiting, has been waiting for a long time for the answer to his questions, which I'm going to read in a second. I just wanted to add to Enrico's list of what has to be done. One thing from my working experience, I think we very much um, deal from our industry perspective with great concepts and great visions coming from, in our case, particular European Union then finding that in the nitty gritty, particularly in terms of climate change, for instance, that it will be very, very tricky to implement those um, because we haven't talked about to each other um, uh, enough. 
also including uh, uh, other stakeholders like, like, like the younger generations too. So what I would say is completely necessary to do as well, what can we do, what must we do, is really uh, encourage more talking to each other between the several groups and institutions, policymakers, population, young and old, industry, because it's, it, it will only work if everybody's on board. Okay, that's that was it. And now to Mr. Bernard Snow's uh, question. We're already done time-wise, but, but it's really it's very uh, interesting, and we should we should continue for five minutes if that's okay. <laughs> so the question is: Should repurposing concentrate on repurposing the enterprise from maximizing shareholder value to pursuing social progress? achieving SG, SEG, um, sorry, easy ESG objectives under the constraint of being financially sustainable, also responsible consumption and responsible investment by individuals. That was it. If for you to, to, to read along, it's, it's displayed down there if you haven't, uh, if you haven't, haven't seen it. Um, sometimes that who, so. Uh, Can I say one word about this? Very please. short. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed, uh, this is very important and it's great that even during this dramatic crisis, uh, save, saving uh, trends uh, uh, show that people are reorienting their savings towards uh, uh, ESG, Environment, Social Governance funds. And uh, there is a very quick uh, change also in companies as they need to rethink about themselves uh, to respond to this crisis. And uh, at least in Italy, uh, several of them are just using sustainability as a, the new compass. The point is that this is too slow. And look at what's going on at the European Central Bank uh, uh, level, where there is a big discussion between different central banks whether the central bankers should risk to create a, a distortion, a bias in the markets, just pushing their investments towards green activities after the huge bias that was due to the fact that the, the markets didn't recognize the risk of climate change. Mm. Okay. Very Anybody briefly, else? Yes, I, I already uh, kind of mentioned this in my previous uh, intervention, just very briefly. I think that uh, uh, it's possible to argue that uh, these last 40 years of turbo capitalism uh, uh, have been periods of extreme individualism in which the corporation and the consumer actually lost a little bit, uh, uh, you know, a reflection of the, of the different stakeholders uh, around. It's very difficult, difficult from an economics perspective to, to actually go, go go back to more, more responsible companies without uh, regulations and incentives. It's not going to happen naturally. So that's why I think, as I said before, we need to adapt a little bit the regulation, but hope that we can be able to do that as, as it was in the post Second World War period. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think looking at the time, Henning, what do you mean? What do you think? Yeah. We leave it like that. Oh, what do we do? Yeah, I think so. Uh, <laughs> so it was uh, fantastic listening to your conversation. So thank you very much to all the panelists and especially uh, to you, Marie-Christine. So it was certainly a good choice to ask you <laughs> this panel and I will do so uh, next time. And uh, well, this is almost the end of this year's conference. And uh, let me say that I, I, I want to thank especially uh, Mark for putting this together. Uh, mm -hmm. I can only say from my side that it's a great opportunity yeah. and uh, we really, we are really grateful uh, that we can you be your partner in, in setting up this conference. And from Monday on, uh, you Massimo and I will together work on, on setting up uh, next year's conference. So entering the way to, to Naples. Right. Uh, we don't know yet what the what the title of the conference can be. So in, in 2017, we started with, I don't know, collectivity, I think, that it was, uh, uh, we ended up with imagination and I don't know what, what, what can be uh, the title of the next conference, 
but Mark, it's great to do this together with you. And this is a great cooperation and friendship. And uh, well, the, the last words, uh, you deserve to, 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 to say the last words. So thanks from my side to the entire uh, audience and all the panelists. It was great and fascinating to listen. Thank Mark. you, Ying. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to, in fact, our speakers for these last uh, sessions, uh, which I think uh, fitted very well with all the conversations we have over the last three days, you know, transformative world, repurposing, you know, I think uh, maybe more hope for Europe. I think uh, what was impossible before to do become now inevitable. Just think about fiscal policy, think about Europe and recovery fund. I think um, Enrico mentioned a lot of things happening in Italy. Next year, Italy will be sharing the G20. I think this is also an opportunity, even hopefully we will be able to meet face to face, to really lay out what we have discussed over the last three days. I think um, we have to be hopeful. The world is changing. There is a major transformation. Either we go to a great reset, I think as one of our speakers mentioned uh, yesterday, or we can have a more uh, and we can have a more optimistic view that uh, despite all the bad news that we have been seeing over the last few months. I think we have to be hopeful that um, we can still change the world and contribute to it. So I want to thank all our panelists for the last three years, all our audience who have been quite uh, patient to listen to all these interesting uh, conversations. We will continue indeed uh, the conversation online um, over the next few months. And uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Ening, you, you, your colleagues, and also Massimo and SRM uh, and ZBRD who have been supporting uh, V7 with TCSA also, so all great partners and for, the, for this conference. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you in person very soon. Thanks a lot.